Welcome to praise the Lord, Betty Baxter. Will you do that? Hi, Betty. Hi. How you doing? Hi. It's been, uh, it's been a long time since we've uh, seen each other. Long we've, time. <laughs> we've kind of uh, traveled a few miles together and some... We could write a few books, couldn't we? I think so. And uh, a few adventures through Africa and India and Sri Lanka and the Caribbean and, and America and a few other places, can't we? That's true. For, uh, what, nine, I'm trying to say nine years you travel with Oral Roberts. Eleven. Only missed it two, didn't <laughs> What was that like? It was great. It was some of the greatest memories I have of traveling in the big tent with Oral Roberts great days. You know, have you ever stopped to think about how many people that are watching tonight do not even know what we're talking about? By that, I mean they've never seen firsthand what it was like back, it, well, we say, we'll use Oral Roberts back when he started his ministry. He started uh, uh, in a tent, did he not? I think so. I wasn't with him with the beginning. I think maybe at first he started in an auditorium and then yeah. soon went to a tent. These great big tents around the country. Was that exciting? You that remember? It was exciting. Huh? It was great. And the prayer lines, and then you'd come in and, and share that miracle testimony. After all these years, uh, I think what has touched me the most, I've heard your testimony many times, but I have never in my life, before the Lord, I can say that every time for me is like the first time. And I think that's... That happens because it seems like it's the first time for you. Is, right. is that right? Yes, it, it seems that way. It's become so real to me. I live over it again. until It's just as thrilling each time I tell it as it was when I first told it. We sure love you, and we're really glad that you're here. And I just want to tell you this so you'll be real comfortable. You just move around all you want to, and you do anything you feel led of the Lord, because Betty has shared this testimony before over a million people in person in America alone, but a lot more than that by now. Uh, she's been in Malaysia, uh, literally around the world, well, uh, giving this testimony. Miracles after she shares this testimony, we're going to take time to talk about, but you're f still full-time evangelist, and how long... Yeah, I shouldn't ask. Is that our that's test? right. That's not good to ask a lady how long. I'm sorry. I, well, now, see, if you had been, <laughs> you'd been someone else, I could just ask, couldn't I? But for years, you shared this testimony. For years. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure I started preaching probably before you were born. Well, I just told folks you were 15. Oh, that's good. So that's uh, many, many years. <laughs> I'm really in trouble on all this tonight, aren't I? <laughs> but I want, you to, I want you to open your heart, and I want you just to do what God wants you to do and share that uh, for our viewing audience tonight. Father, anoint Betty with the Holy Spirit. May thousands and thousands of people tonight, sick in their body, be healed by the power of God. Lord, people tonight, the doctors have said it's impossible, but not with God. Anoint her. Bless her tonight as she shares this, and we'll ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to kind of get off over here, and I'll be amen in you, and, and God bless you tonight. Give Betty Baxter a big hand. Will you do it? Thank you, Dwight, and I'm happy to be here tonight. It's been a long time since I've been at TBN, and it's a real thrill to be back with you. I've been a lot of places since I was here last and uh, done a lot of things and seen some wonderful things that the Lord has been doing around the world as I've traveled here and overseas and it's just a real joy to be with you. I wanted to read a scripture tonight because, as Dwight said, there must be many that are listening tonight that perhaps have never heard me tell the story, and yet I've told it so many times in so many years. But a favorite scripture of mine before I was healed, my mother read to me, often every day and sometimes more than once a day. And it's a picture of what I was exactly before the Lord came and set me free, and it's found in the 13th chapter of Luke and the 11th verse, and it says, Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. I'm thankful tonight 
for the miracle power of Jesus Christ. I can never remember, as I look back over my life and as a child, I can never remember the time of being normal, healthy, well, and strong like other children. But as far back as I can remember, I remember being sick and weak and suffering pain in my body. I was taken to many doctors throughout the years of my childhood, and after examination, x-rays, and tests, every doctor had the same answer, that there was nothing that could be done for me. I was born and raised in a Christian home, and I thank God that I had the privilege to have a born-again mother and daddy. But the church my parents were members of did not believe and teach divine healing like we do today. So, of course, we knew nothing about trusting God for healing for the body. And so, consequently, I was taken to many doctors and hospitals at the age of 11. I was taken to our own family doctor for a routine checkup, and he said there was nothing more that he could do for me. But he sent me to a large hospital in Minnesota. They said they, had the, they are the finest doctors and specialists that can be had. If anybody could help me, they could. But after being there for two or three weeks, about three weeks, and x-rayed every part of my body, I had a specialist for every part of my body, they sent me home to die. I was born with every vertebrae in my spine out of place. The bones were twisted and matted together. I became bent and bowed at the time of my healing. When they stood me up, I stood only as high as my four-year-old baby brother. Large knots grew up and down my spine. My head was twisted on my body and paralyzed like this. I could not move it. My arms were paralyzed from my shoulders to my wrists. I could only move my fingers. My heart was enlarged nearly twice its normal size till it was very difficult for me to breathe and often had to use oxygen. And in this condition, when there was no hope for me at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the age of 11, and I was sent home to die, as I came home that day from the hospital, I was lying there on my bed weeping and crying because the doctor had told my daddy, there's nothing that can be done for her. Don't try to find another doctor. Take her home and keep her as happy as possible. I was lying there crying when Mama came in the room and leaned over the bed, and she said, my, my, why all the tears? Aren't you happy to be back home with Mama again? I said, I'm happy to be back home, but you don't know what the doctor told my daddy. She said, of course I know what he said. He said, what every doctor has said, said through the years, he said, you're going to die. But you're not going to die because I found the answer. And I thought Mama had found another doctor. So excitedly, I said, Mama, what is his name? And she said, smiled and said, his name is Jesus. I said, but Mama, I already asked the pastor. And pastor said he doesn't heal anymore. And Mama said, but there's one thing that goes beyond the word of a pastor. And that's the word of God. And she said, while you're in the hospital, I grew desperate. And I began to read the New Testament over and over again. And as I read it, I found divine healing. I found a scripture that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means just as he healed when he's alive and walked the shores of Galilee, he's still healing today. I found another scripture that says, all all things are possible if you can only believe. Well, you know, faith is case catching, is contagious. You will leave here tonight with more faith than you came, you there in the audience, because you will catch my faith. I will catch yours. And if Mother began to talk to me, faith caught on in my heart. I forgot all about wanting to die and was believing with Mama that Jesus would surely come and heal me and make me whole. But after coming from the hospital, I did exactly as the doctor said I would. I grew much worse and not any better. I was so bad they isolated me from the world. The doctor said I could only see mama, daddy, and the doctor because of the condition of my heart. When my grandmother came to visit me, I had a heart attack. And so I was isolated from the world. But day after day, lying alone in my room, bent and crippled, I'd hear the audible voice of Jesus. He came many times to my bedside, would softly call me by my first name, Betty, he'd call three times. Anxiously, I'd say, Jesus, stay and talk with me for a little while. I'm lonely. He would tell me that he loved me, and I felt very insecure, not being sure that anybody really loved me. But Jesus said he loved me. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even unto the end. As time went by, I grew worse, and one evening as Mama came in my room, she found me unconscious. I was in a coma. She said I was breathing hard and fast, and then paused complete silence. She could find no pulse at all. And then paused complete silence. She could find no pulse at all. There was a gurgling sound in my throat, fluid coming from my mouth. 
She ran and called the doctor and told him to come home imme come back immediately and to see about me. The doctor came to my bedside and Mama said, what's wrong with her? Why is she breathing so strange? Why does she look like this? And the doctor said, it's, it, she's lived now longer than we ever thought she would, but this is it. She will never regain consciousness again. In this unconscious state, she's going to die. So in this condition, he said, if there's anyone you want to call while she's still alive and breathing, you must call them at once. My relatives came, grandparents, aunts and uncles, people gathered in my room. For four days and nights, I lay unconscious to this world, knowing nothing. And during that time, with everyone, even my daddy included, waiting for me to die, my mama still didn't give up hope. She didn't eat, but she fasted and prayed that I would not die, but that God would still heal me and give me back to her again. And the reason I'm alive, and in this city and on this television tonight, is because I I had a mother who would not be denied. She would not give up. She f hung on in faith, believing that all things are possible if you can only believe. The fifth morning, I became conscious. Mama was leaning over my bed. When she saw my eyes, she could tell that I was conscious. She shook me and said, Betty, it's mother. You know me. I tried to speak, but I was so weak, no words would come. And so she leaned over again and said, Betty, it's Mama, don't you know me? And I smiled to let Mama know I was conscious of that I knew her. When I smiled and Mother knew I was conscious, she raised both hands and began to praise God because she felt God had answered her prayer and given me back to her again. As I saw Mama standing there with arms of praise, praising God, Above everyone in the whole world, I love my mama best of all. My mother was everything to me since I was born. She had her bed in the same room with mine. If I ever wanted anything, day or night, mama was there at my bedside, and I loved her so much. She was the dearest one to me. And as she stood there praising God, I thought, if I should die, mama would miss me, but just for a little while at first. And then she'd soon get used to me being gone. And I know that if I were to die, I'd be better off because Mama often would sit by the bed. And she'd say, I've got time to tell you a story. What would you like to hear today? And over and over, I'd say, Mama, please, again, tell me of that place of many mansions. I never got tired of hearing Mama tell of the glories and beauty of that city. She told me there's a land that is fairer than day and that by faith we can see it afar. She said, the Father waits over the way. She said, there's gates of pearl and streets of gold. And she said, the greatest thing about heaven, there are no cripples in that land. Everybody will walk tall and straight on the streets of gold. She said, all pain is gone forever. You'll never have another pain. Do you blame me that I long to go to that place where for the first time I'd be free from the pain I suffered in my body? So closing my eyes tightly, I actually prayed to die. And I said, Jesus, for a long time, Mom and I have trusted you to heal my body, and somehow you haven't healed me. I'm not going to ask you why. That's up to you. And if you don't want to heal me, Lord, it's all right. But please, Jesus, if you're not going to heal me, please come and take me to that land Mama's told me about. And as I prayed to die, thick black darkness settled about my bedside. They'd never left me in a dark room alone before. Always a light burning, and Mama or Daddy, one was with me. But I was alone in the darkness and frightened. I whispered, Daddy, where is my Daddy? I want my Daddy. But you'll find out, as I did at the hour of death, you may call for your Daddy, but he won't answer. You may call for your Mama, but she won't come to you. You may long for a husband and wife who's always been there. But in that hour of death, there's only one that's able to go beyond the veil of death with you. And that one is the... The Lord Jesus Christ and he's the only one. I looked ahead in the darkness and in front of me it appeared to look like a long dark narrow looking valley. In a floating sensation I floated just inside the valley. It was worse inside the valley than out. It was not only dark, it was very very cold and I shivered and shook my twisted crippled body. I was shivering and shaking because I was so very cold. And in a scared whisper, I asked myself the question, where am I? What is this awful place? And from somewhere far, far in the distance, I recognized and heard my mother's voice saying softly, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I said, that's it. I prayed and asked to go to heaven. And if this is the way that gets me to Jesus, I'm willing to go. But I was barely inside when the place lit up 
with a light lighter than day because where Jesus is, there can be no darkness. He is the light of the world. He will light this dark valley for the Christian. Somebody's big strong hand took mine and squeezed it. I didn't need to turn and look. I knew it was the nail-scarred hand of Jesus who said he'd never leave me. He'd never forsake me. He'd be with me always, even unto the end. At last I came out and saw the most beautiful land I've ever seen. Separating me from this beautiful place was a wide, wide river, and the waves were tossing and rolling angrily against the shore. But I looked on the other side of the river and saw that land where those who die in Jesus go to rest and await the resurrection morning. The river of life was winding its way through that land because it's a land where we'll never grow old. Flowers blooming, flowers of every color, flowers that will never fade or die because that's heaven. Standing right across the river waiting to welcome me were a group of those that had been saved by the same Christ that had saved and redeemed me. They smiled and beckoned for me to cross the river and then raising their arms high together in sweet harmony they sang holy, 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 Hosanna to the King. As I saw them, I looked on the other side, and I looked at everyone, and not a single one was bent and bowed and twisted and crippled like my body was. Not a single one had arms, useless, paralyzed at their side like mine. Not a single one was crying because of pain or burdens too heavy for them to bear. And I said, in just a few moments, I'm going to join that heavenly band. And the moment I step across the river, I'll straighten up and have a new body, and I'm going to run all over God's heaven. I was so anxious to get across the river. But Jesus, standing right beside me, spoke and said, No, baby, you'll not cross. Go back and suffer a little while longer. You'll have healing in the fall. This happened in the early part of March, from March until August. Those months are blank and lost to me as I lay in a coma. That part of my story, you'd have to get from my family. I remember nothing. One day when I became conscious, and it was very, very hot, Mother was beside the bed and my lips moved. She put her ear down to hear what I'd say. And in a weak whisper, all the louder could speak before I was healed. I whispered to Mom and said, what day is today? She smiled and said, it's the 14th day of August. So then I knew how many months I had lost in between. I whispered to her that I wanted to see my daddy. Daddy soon came in the bed. In the bedroom, he reached over down and picked up my ugly, twisted body and sat down on the edge of the bed and held me in his arms. Tears rolled down his face and fell on mine as he held me there. Then when he could get so he could speak, Daddy said to me, there's something I want to tell you. I haven't had a chance. You've been unconscious, and I want to tell you now. I've loved you ever since you were given to us, a tiny baby. Daddy's done all in his power to make you well. I've had the finest specialists and doctors I could get for you. I spent all the money I've got and gone deep in debt, but Daddy shook his head and said, I can't find a doctor that's great enough to make you well. I can't find one that will cure, me, uh, cure you, and there's nothing more that I can do for you. He smiled at me and said, but Jesus loves you, and it won't be very long until he'll send the angels for you. They'll pick your little twisted body up in their arms and carry you straight to heaven. And when you get to Jesus, you'll straighten up and have a new body. You won't be twisted and crippled anymore. But I wondered how Daddy could be so sure I was going to die. But he could not believe with Mama that God still heals today and that he has the power to heal me. Always in my room, they kept a large overstuffed chair pumped high with pillows. If I was out of my bed, they would sit me on the pillows with my head resting on my knees and my arms stiff at my side is the only way I could sit in a chair. I asked him to put me in the big chair, and he placed me in the chair, and then I told him to go out closed the door. I had to be alone. I heard him cry as he left the room because they knew I hated to be alone. The only time I ever asked to be alone is when I had an appointment with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. As Daddy closed the door, his tears rolled down my face. I sitting there, I'd been told all my life that I couldn't live to grow up. I would die, but I never believed him. But sitting there that day, I knew I would never have to pray to die again. I knew I was dying. I knew that unless God healed me and did it quickly, I could not go on living. And I'd come this far, and Mama said by the Bible she had proof that Jesus heals today. So I didn't want to give up and die. I'd come this far. I wanted to trust God that Jesus.
Jesus heals today. So I didn't want to give up and die. I'd come this far. I wanted to trust God and let him heal me. Sitting there, I wondered how I could get the attention of Jesus. I prayed and said, Jesus, remember a long time ago when I almost got to heaven and you wouldn't let me cross the river. You said to go back and suffer a little while longer. You'd heal me in the fall. I said, it's still awful hot today, so I don't reckon you really call this fall yet, do you, Lord? But I wonder for this one year, would you call it fall and come and heal me? Well, you know he'll change the times and the seasons for his children if he so desires. But when I ask God for something and really want an answer, I pray and ask him, and then I stay where I am, and I grow very still and quiet. And I wait and listen for him to answer me back. He's alive. He's up there. He hears me when, he pro- when I pray and he has the power to answer me. You say, Betty, you mean God really speaks to people today? Certainly. There are many ways he speaks. The most common way he speaks is through his word. He speaks to me through tongues and interpretation. He speaks to me through a pastor. But he also can speak in an audible voice if he so desires. But sitting there, I got no scripture. I got no inner voice. I got no audible voice. I got nothing. You say, then, Betty, what do you do when you're asking for something and you get no answer? Do like I do. Hang in there in faith and ask again. The Word says if we knock, it'll be open. If we ask, we're going to be answered. If we knock, it'll be open. Seek, and we're going to find. And so sitting there, I wondered how I could get his attention. I begged and coaxed him to heal me. But I thought as far as I can remember, I've never told the Lord I'd do anything for him if he'd heal me. So sitting there, I said, Jesus, listen to me, and I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll heal the organs in my stomach, put them in their proper place so I can eat and digest solid food and gain strength. I'll use all that strength for your service. If you'll heal my heart and give me a brand new strong heart, I'll use that strong heart for you. I said, Jesus, I want to be healed so bad, I'll go further than that. If you'll heal me on the inside and heal me on the outside and make me perfectly whole, from this day on, my life will no longer belong to Betty Baxter, but I'll be yours. And I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do, and I'll be what you want me to be. That's the promise I made for the healing that I have tonight. I sit it trembling, waiting, was sitting there trembling, waiting if he would answer me. Or when again I get no answer, when in an audible voice beside the chair, Jesus spoke audibly and said, Betty, I'm going to heal you completely. August the 24th, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. He gave me the hour. He gave me the day, the time. That isn't strange. God knows all of our tomorrows, doesn't he? The first thought I had was, won't mama be tickled when I tell her? She says, I'll be healed. But what will she say? When I tell her I know the day and hour he's going to do it. Then Jesus spoke and said, now don't tell this till my time comes. And I thought, how will I ever keep from telling Mama? I've never had a secret from her. I tell her everything. But the door opened. I heard Mama coming in. And you know, in those days, there wasn't tapes on healing or books on healing like we have today. Mama just read God's Word, and she didn't know a lot about healing, only what the Word says. And then Mama taught me, and the one thing she continually told me, Betty, if we want to receive a miracle, we must be careful never to displease the Lord or disobey Him. So I knew I couldn't disobey by telling Mama I'd have to keep still. So I kept my mouth shut very tight so I wouldn't open it and let it slip and tell her. She came in and sat on the floor and looked at my face. She talked about my family, my little brothers. And then smiling, she said, Honey, do you know when... The Lord's going to heal you. In all the years before, when I didn't know, she hadn't asked me. And now when I knew it wasn't supposed to tell, she asked. I couldn't tell her. Jesus said not to her. Not to. So I just looked at her and said, when? She said, August the 24th, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. I said, Mama, how'd you know? Did I let it slip and tell you? She said, oh, no. The same God that talks to you, he talks to me, too. So it made me doubly sure. On the 24th day of August at 3 o'clock, he would heal me. I said, Mama, if you really believe it, don't wait, not even till tomorrow, but go to town right now and get a new dress and shoes and let's have them all ready when Sunday comes. So when I get healed at 3 o'clock, 
I can wear them and go to church on Sunday night. That's what I've been waiting for. I want you to think tonight of the fantastic faith my mother had. When nobody around us believed, the pastor didn't believe, the church didn't believe. Even my daddy was doubtful he could not believe Jesus still heals today. Mama got dressed and went to town and came home with a dress and a new pair of shoes. That was the greatest day of my life, lying bent over in bed. There was a place at the foot of the bed where I could see, and she put the dress and the shoes beside the dress. And I made no difference how long she left me alone. I was never lonely anymore because I never got tired of looking at the new dress and shoes thinking, won't I be pretty when Sunday comes? And Jesus makes me straight, and I put on my new dress and shoes, and I'll go to church and be normal just like other girls. Finally, the days passed. If Daddy were here, he would tell you that he knew she had suspicion for a long time. Something was wrong with Mother and I, and when he saw the dress and shoes, he knew something was wrong with us. Daddy said he actually thought we've at last lost our minds. No one believed. Everyone looked at us strange. But I want you to know you can stand on the Word of God, and it makes no difference what man will say if God's Word says it's so, that it's going to come to pass because His Word cannot lie. He watches over His Word to perform it. Finally, Sunday came. I was suffering worse than I'd ever suffered in my life. If you're sitting there tonight and the pain is worse than it's ever been, just take heart. That's a good sign you'll be healed because the devil's mad at you. And I was suffering worse than I'd ever suffered. And I said, devil, go ahead and hurt me all you want to because after 3 o'clock you can't hurt me anymore. Mama come and said, I've got the chair in the living room. And the family is all there and some others have come to see and it's almost time for Jesus to come. She took me and placed me and put me on the pillows in the living room. With my head on my knees, I could see the feet of my family and those who had come that night. I was so happy it's time for Jesus to come. I don't know what you do when you get happy. Some people jump, some people run, some people scream. But I, when I get real happy, I usually cry real hard. And the tears are streaming down my cheeks. I'm so happy. It's time for Jesus to come. My baby brother, four years of age, when they stood me up as exact, exactly as high as he was, he'd been my constant companion all his life. He would stay by my bed as a little baby. Mama had his basket beside my bed. His crib was beside my bed. He grew up in my bedroom. And he'd known me all that time. And as he knelt there at my knees, he saw the tears on my face. He shook his little head and said, Don't cry anymore, sis. It'll only be a minute. Then you'll be bigger than I am. And then Mama said, It's time now for Jesus to come. Is there anything you want us to do before he comes? And remember, there's no pastor there. And there's no evangelist there. And I felt like somebody should do something. So I said, Mama, pray. We must be praying when he comes. The last thing I remember was Mama saying, You promised at 3 o'clock you'd come and heal her. You're not a man that you would lie or break a promise. Come now and heal her for your own glory. Then I didn't hear Mama pray anymore. I heard a great noise as if a storm was coming up. The wind was roaring and rushing and raging. Through the room went a rushing mighty wind. And the drapes in the, in the room swung in the breeze. A door slammed somewhere, and yet outside it was a still, quiet day. When the wind left the room and all was still and quiet, Mama said, everyone can hear me whisper, he's coming. Don't you hear him? He's coming at last. I didn't know from where he would come, but I knew somehow that wind was bringing Jesus. And in the stillness, I waited with my head on my knees. I could only see one part of the room. And as I watched and waited, I saw taking form across the room from me a great white fleecy cloud, pure white, no gray, no dark in it, perfectly white. And as I looked at the white cloud, stepping forth out of that cloud came Jesus, dressed in glowing garments of glistening white, white that we've never seen in this world. Arms outstretched toward me, and I saw the ugly print of the nails in his hands and knew he was my Jesus. Slowly he walked to the side of the chair. Then he leaned down and smiled and said, Betty, you've been patient, kind, and loving. And those and henceforth, I'm going to promise you health, joy, and happiness. And those words repaid me for all I'd ever suffered. And as he spoke those words, I saw him reach out his hand. My body became tense, waiting for the touch of Jesus. But all at once, 
Inside it we've been a very hot feeling, two hot hands as hot as fire pressed on the lower part of my stomach. I literally felt organ shift as moved as they went into their proper place. I knew when they x-rayed me everything would be perfect. I knew from that moment on I could eat anything and nothing would ever hurt me anymore. Two hot hands as hot as fire took my enlarged started and squeezed it. When he let it go for the first time in my life, I could take a deep breath without gasping, without pain, and I knew that my heart trouble was gone because he's a heart specialist. He's a cancer specialist. He's an arthritis specialist. There's nothing impossible with the God we're serving tonight. There's nothing impossible with the God we're serving tonight. I knew on the inside, he healed me completely without outside. My family could see no change. I was an ugly, twisted, deformed, crippled. I looked at Jesus quickly to see if he'd leave me half healed. But when he begins something, he will finish it. He smiled and reached out his hand and one of the large knots in the center of my spine. I felt a hand placed there I'd never felt before, a hand charged of the divine healing virtue of Jesus. A tingling sensation started my feet and came cover it went through my entire body I heard the bones crack and pop as the vertebrae went into praise place in the presence of my family and those who were there they saw the knots fade and disappear and leave my spine my head snapped back into its right position my paralyzed arms raised high and in 10 seconds I jumped from the chair and stood as straight as I'm standing tonight I've been healed by the mighty power of Jesus Christ he had healed me completely and made me whole. You say, Betty, you mean instantly he healed you? I mean that. And when he instantly heals, that's called a miracle. That's not the only way he heals. There is a gradual healing. I pray for folks, and then sometimes three, four, six months later, a letter comes to the office telling me that from the time they were prayed for, they felt the power of God and went, and day by day and week after week, they got better and better till at last they were perfectly whole. That's a gradual healing. He heals both a gradual healing and an instant healing. And it makes no difference just as long as he gets it done right. But he instantly made me whole. My baby brother jumped up and got down, clapping his hands, saying, Look at her. She's bigger than me. She's bigger than me. My sisters took all the hands, hugged each other, and danced around the floor. I looked everywhere in the room because I was searching for my daddy who just could not believe that Jesus heals today. I saw him by the living room door, his head in his hands. He was sobbing and crying. I walked over to him, pulled his hands down and looked at him. Made him look at me and I said, Daddy, do you believe now? God can heal. Should I believe anything after I seen this? It made a real believer out of my daddy. But the greatest part of the whole story is this. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. He's no respecter of persons. He does not love Betty Baxter more than he loves you. He loves you, and as soon as you come to him in simple, childlike faith, not you don't have to have a great big faith. People are trying to have great faith. Let me tell you something. You can get healed with a little faith in a great big God. Have faith in a great big God. All of our efforts could not do it. But if we have simple childlike faith to believe God, God's ready to meet your need. As I stood there completely healed, you asked me how I felt. I could keep you another hour and try to tell you. At the end of the second hour, you'd still never know unless you've been a hopeless crippled. It was something to look back at the chair and know it wouldn't ever hold me anymore. I could sit down if I wanted to, but I could get up and walk. But my entire body was strangely numb, and I felt in my body wondering why I feel numb all over. And then it came to me. This numb feeling must be what it feels like to have no pain in your body. And ever since he healed me, I've been enjoying that numb feeling. I praise God. When he healed me, he took the pain from my body. If you forget all the rest of the story tonight, always remember this part. It's the greatest. Don't ever forget it. As I stood there straight, healed by God's power, I looked back at the empty chair, and standing beside the chair still stood Jesus. His arms were outstretched toward me. He looked from the soles of my feet to the top of my head, and when I saw Jesus looking at me, I stood as straight as I could so he could see how good he made me. 
I believe he stayed to enjoy his handiwork, don't you? As he stood there, he looked deep into my eyes. And looking in my eyes, Jesus smiled and spoke these last words. Betty, I've given you the desire of your heart. I've healed you completely and made you whole. And I nodded my head because I knew he had. Still looking at me, he said, but I've got to leave you here for a little while. I'm going back to the Father and finish that mansion that's almost ready for you. I want you to go out and tell the world what I've done for you. Because when men and women hear this story, they'll be saved. And when they hear this story, they'll be healed and brought to God. And then smiling just before he backed in the cloud and went away, he smiled and said, And be thou faithful. And every day watch for a cloud. And the next time you see me coming in a cloud, I'm not going to leave you here. But I'm going to take you to be with me forevermore. He's coming back again. He said he was. Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. Since the day he healed me. Every day I've watched for that cloud. I haven't seen it yet. But someday I will. He never breaks a promise. And there are times, especially when I'm overseas and I'm homesick and tired, that I'll get on a jet and go way high and look at the white fleecy clouds and think if I look at one long enough, I'll see his face. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for Jesus to come back again. Heaven tonight is realer to me than it's ever been in all of my life. People across America and even overseas have written me letters and said, by hearing my story, they feel like they know my mama. I had my mother a long time. We were living in Singapore in September, and I was in Malaysia having a meeting. My husband called from Singapore and told me I'd have to catch a plane out of Malaysia to come back. We had to come back to America. My daddy had passed away. I'd never lost anybody close to me before. And all that long journey back from Malaysia to Singapore, from Singapore to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to Minneapolis. I got to Minneapolis, Minnesota, near where my parents live. And my baby brother I told you about met the plane. Daddy was gone. Mama seemed to be doing all right. But the doctor told Mama she couldn't attend Daddy's funeral, and she smiled and said, I'll be there. The doctor told my baby brother, tell her that I can't allow her to go. The emotional upset would be too much. My baby brother said, Mama, you can't go to Daddy's funeral, and she smiled and said, I'll be there. I arrived early on a Friday morning. I went to the funeral parlor where my Daddy lay and looked at him. And then I grew restless. I wanted to go back and see Mama. I'd been overseas for several months. And always my heart yearned to see my mother. I called her from Singapore, which to her was clear. It's like you, outer space. Mama thought that that was something unheard of, to think she could hear my voice clear from Singapore. So I was restless. We, I looked at Daddy. He looked so nice. He always dressed up and... My baby brother had him dressed in his nice dark suit and white shirt. And I looked at his face and stood there for one hour looking at his face and telling him that I loved him and thanked him for all he'd done for me since a child. But then my heart grew restless and I went to my baby brother and said, we've done all we can for daddy. He's gone, but mama still lives. And I feel I got to go see her. I went to see mama. She was been sitting in a chair, was sitting there when I got there. Everything was all right. She seemed to be doing so good with sitting in the chair. After we arrived, and she was so anxious, they said she kept asking when was my husband going to get there. And she wanted to be sure that he was there. When she saw he was there, she says, tell them to put me back in my bed. I'm so very tired. She lay there and seemed to sleep, and then she, her head moved from the pillow, and her eyes got very wide. And I've been with many people when they went home to be with Jesus, and I saw that look and knew it. I screamed at my baby brother, Mama's going, and he said, No, Betty, she's resting, but I knew better. It wasn't ten minutes the Mama slipped away, 
Instead of having Daddy's funeral on Sunday, we had a double one on Monday. And that day I lost the greatest friend I've ever had or ever will have, my mama. The reason I'm alive and able to tell this story tonight is because of a little mother. Nobody knows her name. She couldn't leave us very much, but she left me the greatest heritage of all, faith in God. I talked to my sister who was there to visit them. And just two days before Daddy passed away, she said they were sitting in their chair side by side. And they were holding hands like they'd done for years. Daddy was 80, Mama was 78. And they're holding hands like they'd done for years. Daddy was 80, Mama was 78. And they all had their own little apartment, took care of themselves. And Daddy often said to me, whatever we desire, the Lord will give us that desire. And I've asked that I never be on crutches or wheelchair or put in a nursing home. I ask he takes me while I'm able to walk and get around. Two days before he fell asleep, went to sleep one night and never woke up. My sister said they were sitting in their chairs, and they looked at each other. And Mama said, all our life, they'd been married some 64 years. All our life, we've lived by the Bible, and that's the way we'll die. And she said, we're going to take that scripture, Matthew 18, where it says, and if any two shall agree is touching one thing, it shall be done. And she said, now, Dad, we make a covenant with God and each other. If one goes home, the other one will follow. And as I looked at him in the front of the church, in that little assembly of God church where they'd gone there all their life, and as I stood there and looked at him, I thought how wonderful to live so close to Jesus that he gives you the very desire of your heart that when your companion of so many years goes, you can go right along with them. And you know, since then, and that happened in September, and since then, the world and all the things in it have grown strangely dim. And I have one longing in my heart, and that's to reach souls and be ready when Jesus comes. Tonight, there are people listening to me right now that will say, Betty, I don't know Jesus like you know him. And if you were to see the cloud you're looking for, I'd be left behind because I'm not ready for his coming because there's only one way you'll see the cloud, and that's to be saved and born again. Have Jesus as your personal Savior in your heart. Right now, there in your home, wherever you are, just bow your head a moment. Those in the studio are bowing their heads. And right now, I see folks sitting at home. Some of you have habits you cannot break. Some of you are alcoholics and you've tried to stop, but you can't. Others have other things in their life. Right at this moment, you're saying, Betty, I'm not really sure if you'd see the cloud because if I'd see the cloud in this studio... There would be no picture on this camera. I'd be gone. The cameraman would go. We'd all be gone. Because I'm not going to wait to even say goodbye when I see the cloud. Are you ready to go with me? I want to pray this prayer. I want you to repeat it with me right there in your home. And if you'll repeat it and believe it, Jesus will come into your heart. And you'll be ready to meet him just as I am. Repeat this prayer after me. Just pray it right out loud wherever you are. Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I have sinned, and I'm sorry for my sin. Save me right now. Come into my heart. Wash all my sins away. I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I turn away from sin. I'm going to live for Jesus. Help me to live for you. And be ready when you come. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus will get on the telephone. Call that number. It's on your screen. And tell us that you accepted Jesus as your Savior. I'd like to hear from you. If I was in a service right now, I'd call a healing line. And I'd reach out and touch everyone that wanted healing. So I'm going to reach out to you tonight. And I want you to believe right there, some of you sitting there, there's a little lady sitting there in a wheelchair, crippled with arthritis. And you knew what it was when I told about being deformed because you're in that condition. Jesus wants to pass by tonight and set you free. Right now, I want to pray for you. And I want you to reach out by faith. Tonight is your night to receive your miracle. Heavenly Father, I come now in Jesus' name. And I bring these to you right now that have sickness in their lives. I pray that you'd reach out and touch them, that little lady with arthritis. I curse that arthritis in Jesus' name. Heal her right now and make her whole. There's a man with heart trouble right now in Jesus' name. Heal his heart. Give him a new heart right now in the name of Jesus. Heal that little child that's crippled in her legs. Right now, reach out to her and touch her little body and heal her and make her whole. Jesus, reach out and touch the people and heal them because I ask it in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the answer. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You, Let's give the Lord a clap offering for this testimony. <laughs> Betty, join me right here, if you will, please, when you get a chance. People are calling that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lyle in Scottsdale has said yes to God. Jesse in Oklahoma City. Alice in Midwest City, Oklahoma. Henry in Oklahoma City. Little, Jenny, Sandra, Elias, Freddie, uh, Gwendolyn, Anita, Doug have all come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to say to every one of you right now, if you prayed the sinner's prayer a moment ago with Betty, I want you to pick up that phone and call us. We have a prayer partner standing by. We want to send you some literature that's going to help you. But I felt so strongly in my spirit, Betty, just a moment ago, that as you were praying, there's a lot of people that are watching tonight that had a praying mother and a praying father. And many that are watching tonight that knew what it was to have a praying mother and a praying father your mother and father are not with you anymore but you remember their prayers you remember what it was when they took you to church but you're away from God tonight but when she told that story about her mother and dad and both are with the Lord touched your spirit and your parents are in glory and the minute she said that it's not a great revelation that I had to have this happen to me but it's a fact Betty Baxter will see her mom and dad again. You will not unless you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And many of you prayed that prayer, and you know now that you're ready to meet God, and I want to hear from you. Secondly, there are many people that God's touched your body. He healed you. I felt it definitely in my spirit. That when you said the power of God went through your body, I sensed it in my spirit right then. That the power of the Lord went through many people's body right now and you've been healed by the power of God. Please pick up that telephone and call us and tell us right now what God has done in your life. We're going to be back in a moment with Betty Baxter and share some more wonderful things. But I want you, whatever you're doing, we're just going to take time while Jamie Owens Collins sings for you right now. I want you to pick up that phone if you've been healed, if you've been born again, if you've recommitted your life to God. Call me right now and let me hear from you because we want to share what God has done for you. We want to share it with others. Whatever you do, pick up that phone and call us right now and tell us what God has done while Jamie sings for you a song. It's just two words, but they're powerful words. And the song is called The Victor. Call right now. Give Jamie a big hand. Will you do it?